All right. Thank you all for coming to the uh, last talk of, uh, of the, the session. Um, so I'm Charmel Hudson with uh, Two Sigma Investments. And for the past several years, I've been uh, taking apart firmware. And now I need to take apart my, uh, take apart this clicker. <laughs> All right, so I've been working on uh, firmware security research. Uh, two years ago, I presented at CCC uh, Thunderstrike, which was the first, uh, first firmware rootkit for MacBooks that allowed uh, an attacker to overwrite the motherboard uh, boot firmware via a Thunderbolt device. The year after that, I teamed up with uh, Zeno and Corey from LegbaCore, uh, and we ported a bunch of their UEFI vulnerabilities over to uh, Apple's EFI firmware, and were able to show that that common code base allowed uh, vulnerabilities to, to be portable between different systems. But my real passion isn't just breaking things, it's taking them apart, understanding how they work, and then building systems, open systems, that people can extend and use for what they want to do. And that's why I'm really excited to be talking uh, to you today about HEADS, which is a open source uh, firmware for uh, commodity laptops and, and servers. The name is sort of a play on Tails, which is great if you want to have a system where the, uh, you have no state and there's no, nothing logged on it. HEADS is sort of the opposite of that. It's when you want to preserve the state and you want to have some uh, guarantees of the integrity of the system. So let's back up for just a, a quick minute and talk about why is firmware security so important. And the uh, Intel Advanced Threat Research has given a bunch of great talks showing what can firmware vulnerabilities do or firmware malware do. It controls the system from that very first instruction when it starts up which allows it to uh, infect the OS or the hypervisor. It can bypass pretty much any sort of security uh, scanning. It can hide an SMM. It, it's in a very, very uh, powerful position uh, for persistence. And some uh, vendors are even using this uh, to ensure that your computers always have their, uh, their bloatware installed. So even if you do a clean install, it reinstalls itself uh, into the OS. We also know that nation states are taking advantage of these sorts of things and that they're buying vulnerabilities from uh, exploit vendors who are uh, selling them uh, rootkits and things uh, to, to run in, in the firmware. And we've also, we, ha we now have evidence that the, uh, some of these nation state adversaries are watching conferences and re-implementing uh, the security vulnerabilities that are being discussed there. So even ones that are responsibly disclosed and patched by the vendors uh, in, in a few months can be turned into a, uh, a weaponized toolkit by these adversaries. And they know that even though it has been patched in the firmware, uh, in the vendor's official firmware tree, it may be months or years or never uh, that it actually gets installed in the user's system. And one of the reasons for that is there are uh, four or five companies between uh, Intel's reference UEFI implementation, the EDK2 tree, and uh, a user's machine. There are um, independent BIOS vendors, there are device manufacturers, there are OEMs, and there are value-added resellers, all of whom have to coordinate uh, patches and QA to actually get something out there. And this means that a lot of firmware vulnerabilities just never get patched in the wild. And with this uh, EFI firmware comes an enormous amount of complexity. It's millions of lines of code, and uh, it was intended to replace the, uh, the legacy BIOS, the 40-year-old uh, BIOS from the 1970s, and it brought with it a huge amount of uh, complexity, an entire operating system worth of uh, complexity, but didn't really provide any new features. Um, so, a lot of the open source community has never been very happy with it. Um, the HEADS philosophy is that firmware uh, needs to be open. Um, it needs to be flexible so that we can adapt it to, uh, to our own needs. Um, it needs to be something that is well tested and understood. You know, building on something like Linux makes that uh, possible, where we, we use Linux in, uh, for all of our other tasks, why we should use it in our firmware as well. 
and for the security it needs to be built reproducibly and it needs to be measured during the boot process so that we can have cryptographic guarantees that what we are running is what we think we have built so heads is built with two major components the the core boot free firmware and then the Linux kernel that lives in the ROM on the motherboard and then surrounding that is a lot of security research that the the wider community is doing and we're able to incorporate into the firmware using Linux in the ROM is not a new idea uh, it goes back to the, the mid-1990s. Uh, I was at Sandia National Labs, and we were building large-scale parallel machines, um, some of which were tight, custom, tightly coupled, some of which were just clusters of Linux workstations. And on the clusters, we were really frustrated uh, dealing with TFTP and trying to get these uh, machines to boot over PXE. Uh, our colleague, Ron Minnick at Los Alamos, had similar concerns, and he, he looked at uh, what the BIOS was doing and realized that it was duplicating all of the initialization that Linux was doing. So he built a custom firmware for his cluster that uh, just boot, booted straight into Linux. And he called that Linux BIOS, because that's the logical name for it. And in 2008, it was uh, renamed to Core Boot, and uh, uh, when he moved to Google, it was uh, used to power all of the Chromebooks. So the Chromebooks are some of the only non-UEFI uh, x86 laptops out there. And they have done an amazing job on the security uh, aspects, that they have uh, features like write protect screws on the, on the firmware to prevent software, accidental or malicious software writes. Um, they have uh, signed boot chains. They have cryptographically protected file systems. Chromebooks are doing a great job. Um, Alex Damas from uh, Facebook said, that unless you are a security expert, you should probably use a Chromebook. Um, but of course, we're security experts here, so we want, we want to do this ourselves. Um, so uh, we, we want to put Coreboot on our machines. Um, Coreboot has uh, uh, three stages that it goes through. It has a very small boot block that um, uh, initializes the TPM and does some uh, measurements, and then prepares a, what's called caches RAM mode. It then runs uh, a ROM stage in that mode that is able to initialize DRAM and do some early chipset init. Um, and it then sets up a few tables for what it finds and jumps into a payload. So unlike UEFI that has device drivers for your NIC, and your hard drive controller, and your video card, and your USB, um, Coreboot is tiny. It's 1% the size of the UEFI executable. Uh, so the, the trusted computing base, the TCB, is much, much smaller. After it has done that initialization, it jumps into a payload, and it's, it's rather, relatively agnostic about the payload. Uh, it, in the case of heads, it jumps into the heads Linux kernel, and roughly, you know, one second or so after the machine boots up, um, or excuse me, after you power on the machine, it's able to drop you into an interactive shell uh, running out of ROM. And at this point, we can now start to write our initialization scripts and our, uh, define what boot device we want to use and all of the sorts of things that BIOSes usually do, but we can do it with the power of Linux rather than whatever limited uh, functionality is in UEFI. So we can boot from a fully encrypted drive. We can boot from any number of file systems that Linux supports. We can contact network services to determine what uh, our boot policy is or uh, to fetch kernels. You know, meanwhile, UEFI supports booting from unencrypted FAT file systems. So uh, it's still a million lines of code in UEFI, uh, which is you know, a, a shockingly large amount of code for just system initialization. And it doesn't have a huge number of contributors. It doesn't have a uh, sort of the, the time on the internet that Linux does, that Linux's device drivers and network stack are getting hammered every single day uh, by attackers and defenders, and they're really well protected. There are bugs that show up, uh, but they tend to get fixed fairly quickly. 
and uh, they tend to be you know, fairly well understood. There's a, a saying in security that you know, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And uh, you know, court, uh, UEFI has 100 something contributors and GitHub just gives up and says Linux uh, has infinite number. So you know, in addition to being able to uh, have all those contributors, we can tailor the core boot installation to uh, our individual applications that if, if a vendor doesn't want to support your RAID controller or your NIC or something, you're pretty much out of luck. But with, uh, with core boot and Linux, we can build custom versions for, uh, tailored for our own machines. So the, uh, the third major component of, uh, of, of heads is a tool called KExec, which uh, also goes back to the Linux BIOS days. Um, Eric uh, Biederman wanted a way to quickly reboot his diskless clusters. So he uh, hacked up a, a way to start running a new kernel from within um, uh, one that's already up. So in uh, the heads uh, init script, it figures out what kernel you want to use, uh, what initial RAM disk, and then it does a kexec load, and then um, a kexec execute, which starts that kernel running. And how it figures out which kernel to run, or which RAM disk to use, or what kernel parameters, are completely flexible, because it's, it's Linux. It's not uh, some limited vendor, proprietary vendor BIOS. So now that we have this flexible way to uh, bring the system up, how do we actually protect it? Uh, how, how do we uh, deal with the fact that you know, this is a, a dangerous uh, uh, time for computers? And before we go too deep down the security rabbit hole, you know, I want to uh, echo what, uh, what Steph said, that you know, your threat model is not my threat model, that you know, we all have our own individual uh, threats that we're concerned about, you know, what data we're trying to protect depends on uh, who we're going up against. And again, a nice thing about open source is we can tailor a lot of these things to uh, individual threat models. Uh, Johanna Rutowska pointed out that basically every device in a modern system has some kind of programmable firmware and might be trying to attack uh, the boot process. Um, and in a lot of cases, the problem is that uh, firmware assumes the hardware is trusted. Uh, again, advanced threat research presented in Brussels uh, last month, um, a, a really great attack showing that you know, firmware assumes the hardware is doing the right thing. So some, uh, some folks like Peter Stuja suggest we should just remove all the hardware we can't trust from the machine. He has a great guide from uh, 30C3 a few years ago uh, showing how to disassemble a ThinkPad to get rid of everything that, that we can't control, that we can't trust. Um, uh, Intel uh, recommends turning on features like the IOMMU in the firmware to prevent rogue devices from being able to interfere with the boot process. But unfortunately, most uh, UEFI uh, vendors haven't implemented this. Uh, in the case of Core Boot, it, uh, it hasn't brought up the uh, PCIe bridges with bus mastering, so it's not vulnerable. But uh, when it hands over to the, to the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel needs to turn on the IOMMU. Um, and again, it's open source. We can just uh, enable that feature. We can test it on our hardware. We can validate it and we can, uh, w we can build firmware for our systems that have this sort of security feature enabled. Another uh, attack vector is option ROMs, which are executable code loaded from um, uh, PCIe or uh, PCI devices. So this is a slide from my uh, uh, Thunderstrike talk where I revealed my uh, file vault encryption password uh, to a few thousand people. Um, and as uh, Zeno points out, this has been a problem uh, since 2012 with Snares Talk, but it actually goes back even further. John Heisman uh, complained about it in 2007 at Black Hat. He pointed out that option ROMs are basically a, a easy way to get persistence um, before the kernel starts. Again, 
with open source, we can choose whether or not we want to enable this sort of functionality. Uh, as the core boot uh, config file says, if you're concerned about security, you probably want to turn this feature on. Um, it might break some things. Um, there, there's some devices perhaps you want to load an option ROM from, but you can validate it, you can test it, and you can decide if, this, if that security trade-off is worth it. And in general, you don't need option ROMs anymore. Um, once the Linux kernel is up and running, it uses its own internal drivers for all of these uh, devices. Another place that we're taking advantage of uh, good work that's being done by the core boot, excuse me, by the Chromebook team is uh, enabling the non-volatile uh, write protect bits on the spy flash. So that, that uh, uh, boot block and ROM stage of core boot can be uh, made immutable. And this el completely eliminates an entire class of software-based attacks against the system. Um, so Thunderstrike, uh, Light Eater, Dark Jedi, Speed Racer, none of these vulnerabilities would be able to uh, overwrite that boot block um, because you would need physical presence in order to, uh, to modify it. Um, that also protects you against uh, devices that might be on the spy bus and able to, uh, to poke at the, um, uh, at the chip. Uh, one of which is the Intel management engine. And this is a, uh, it's a CPU inside the CPU. Um, uh, uh, Rudolf Merrick called it a Matryoshka CPU. And it's running an opaque binary blob with access to main memory, uh, to your keyboard and mouse, uh, to your network. And it's even listening for packets when your computer is turned off. Um, so, the, the rootkit possibilities inside that management engine are really quite concerning. So I did a bunch of research in uh, how to try to disable it um, and published some findings that um, uh, were turned into uh, the ME cleaner script that can take a, a, uh, the management engine firmware and re remove uh, pretty much all of the rootkit functions and leave just enough functionality to uh, boot the system. This also frees up an additional uh, five megabytes of space in, in the spy flash for the uh, head's payload. And it works on uh, Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge as well as uh, some Skylake systems. Um, although on the Skylake, there's some interaction with Gukard that uh, still needs some, uh, some further research. Okay, so we have a flexible way to boot the system and get it up and running, and we hopefully are reasonably protected against uh, these hardware attacks. We still need to worry about how do we protect the secrets, you know, the disk encryption keys and, and things like that. So HEADS takes a, uh, extensive advantage of the, uh, the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, and it's a cryptographic coprocessor that has really not been well received by the, uh, the open source community uh, because of its association with the, uh, the trusted computing group and Microsoft and DRM. And that's because when it's used in those systems, you don't control the firmware that the, the root of trust is in someone else, not in your own code. But in a core boot and heads system, we control what is being measured and we control that root of trust. The TPM by itself doesn't actually do uh, uh, direct validation of things. It, it has uh, registers called PCRs that uh, only support an operation called extend. And what the extend operation does is it takes the, um, the current value of the register, the hash of some, uh, of some uh, block of code or data, concatenates those together, and then hashes them, and that becomes the new value of the register. So it doesn't directly uh, tell you what has been run, but it allows you to cryptographically uh, verify what that chain uh, of extensions has been. And if the boot block, the immutable boot block that we talked about earlier, um, does an initial measurement of itself, and then measures 
the ROM stage. Uh, and then the ROM stage measures the RAM stage, and the RAM stage measures the payload. At that point, we can, uh, we sh can compute what that value should be in, in the PCR. The other operation the TPM supports is sealing uh, keys in, um, into it, and it will only unseal the key if the PCRs match. So this means that uh, the same uh, code has to be executed doing those measurements in order for the TPM to reveal uh, that, uh, that secret key. And what goes into the measurements is uh, you know, a choice that has a lot of bearing on security. The um, you know, the core boot and the payload are obvious choices. And uh, there's been a lot of writing um, by the uh, uh, Johanna and, and other folks on uh, what else should be measured. And since we have Linux, we can write shell scripts that do things like measure the cryptographic headers of the, um, of the encrypted drives to ensure that someone hasn't uh, swapped out the drive underneath you and is just trying to get your, uh, your disk encryption key. And if we go back to that unsealing operation, um, it also takes a, a password uh, to, uh, to, to do the decryption. And one concern is how do you know that you're, trusting, you're typing your password into a trusted uh, system? That the, uh, someone might have modified the firmware along the way um, and you know, now it's just giving you what looks like a, a valid prompt. Um, some, uh, some things like the anti-evil maid toolkit uh, use the uh, PCRs to seal a uh, secret message that they display to you when, um, if and only if the PCRs match. The problem is that that's pretty easy to replay, that if they can get uh, the contents of that message, they can, in, an attacker could just have the firmware display that to you. So Matthew Garrett uh, presented a really neat idea of using the uh, Google Authenticator, the TOTP system. Um, so rather than having the firmware display a message, uh, it has the keys, um, there we go. Um, it has the computer take that secret and apply the TOTP algorithm to it along with the current time and it generates the, uh, this code, this, this one-time code that's valid for 30 seconds. And the user of the computer can then verify on their phone that that same code is, is uh, uh, being generated. This means that an, an evil maid attacker would have to be somehow proxying between you know, the, uh, the machine with your TPM and the thing that they're trying to get you to log into. So it, it becomes a much, much more difficult uh, job for an attacker to, uh, to subvert. And since we have uh, a full Linux install, we can actually implement uh, Matthew Garrett's idea as a very simple shell script. That uh, it reads a value from, it reads the sealed blob from the TPM's NVRAM. Uh, it unseals it, which will only, the TPM will only do, if and only if the PCRs match, meaning the firmware is unmodified. And then it uh, uses the top P program to compute the, uh, the current, uh, the, ha the um, hash of the current time and that secret. So there's, there's another saying that uh, about folks, uh, there are two types of people who use encrypted data, those who have lost the passphrases and, and those who will. And the TPM adds yet another way for you to lose uh, your, your, pa uh, your disk encryption key. Um, because it's now tied to that specific piece of hardware and the specific firmware install, it's possible that uh, uh, you, know, you might lose access to the key. Um, you might also want to, say, move the drive to another computer and be able to decrypt it there for, uh, um, for recovery. So HEADS takes the uh, disk encryption key and splits it into uh, an arbitrary number of secret shares and uh, you then need to have some number of these to recover the secret. So you can put one you know, in a safety deposit box, you can give one to a friend, you can put one in your, in your password manager. And uh, unless someone can acquire you know, three of them or four of them or whatever threshold you come up with, 
uh, they can't decrypt your, uh, your drive. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Heads firmware has a, a Shamir secret sharing program that will do that, that split for you, and then it can generate uh, QR codes to make it easy to distribute the, uh, the secrets around. Excuse me, distribute the shares around. Another thing that, uh, that HEADS makes use of are hardware tokens like uh, YubiKeys. And uh, these are great because you don't need to, uh, it allows you to not have your, your PGP secret key stored uh, on the disk anywhere. And we use it for uh, validating the, uh, the check-ins on, on the GitHub tree. Um, but it's also then used uh, during uh, boot up that the, uh, the hypervisor, the kernel, and the initial RAM disk are uh, validated against the user's uh, PGP signature. With the heads build, we don't put uh, our keys into the ROM. The users generate their own keys, and that's what uh, goes into the ROM image. Um, because we want the users to be able to control their own machines. You know, we want you to be able to sign your own firmware as well as sign your own operating system installs. Um, so uh, again, we have shell scripts, so we can, we can implement this startup as a fairly simple shell script that does these checks. One concern though is that uh, once you have a valid signature um, for an older version of the software, an attacker might try to roll back and uh, get you to run a, a vulnerable version of the kernel or the, the hypervisor. So we use a third TPM feature, which is the uh, TPM counters, uh, to be able to sign the current counter version. And the counters can't be reset, they only, uh, they only increment. So this prevents uh, any sort of rollback attack from someone who's able to image your drive and bring it in uh, to your machine. And again, a lot of these threats are pretty esoteric. They're not necessarily you know, the, the run-of-the-mill threats that, uh, that everyone expects to encounter, but if we can implement uh, these sort of protections in the firmware, it helps make the whole ecosystem safer. An another place where we're trying to learn from what other uh, what other folks are doing is the Android Verified Boot, which uses a kernel module called a DM Verity that builds a Merkle tree of uh, hashes of the file system blocks. And this gives you a very lightweight way to sign the entire file system with a, um, uh, with a single hash. And the, uh, the, the beauty of this is this encourages um, uh, read-only root file systems, because the idea is you, you generate the, um, uh, the Merkle tree, you sign that, and then any time you do an update, there's an explicit regenerate, resign. So Android has brought this in, and uh, we've been working with, uh, with Cubes to make it uh, possible to use uh, there as well. And Cubes is a uh, very highly recommended, uh, reasonably secure operating system. Um, that uh, I'm very fond of for its, uh, its approach to security through, um, through compartmentalization, that it uses uh, virtualization and virtual uh, machines to separate out different uh, privilege domains. It also moves all of the device drivers and uh, external um, interfaces into, into their own uh, uh, guest OS. Um, and they, uh, they are saying that for their new next version of Cubes, for them to certify any hardware, it must have open source uh, firmware. So there's a lot of you know, similar uh, thoughts going on between their team and, and the Heads team. Another thing Heads is working on doing is being 100% reproducible, which means that if you download the source tree and run make, you will get a bit for bit identical binary uh, to the official build. Um, so here we have a, uh, an Ubuntu system and a uh, Fedora system, and they have you know, precisely the same hash. This is a bit of a process, and unfortunately, uh, compilers seem to go out of their way to make this hard. So we've 
we've been having to push a lot of uh, commits and changes uh, to our dependencies. Um, things like the Zen hypervisor, uh, the BusyBox shell that we use, and for the most part, they've been very receptive to these patches. The other place where we have to worry about it is the, uh, the initial RAM disk for the Linux kernel, um, because the, the, uh, the CPIO file format has dates and user IDs and uh, inode numbers and a bunch of things that, um, that we need to strip out to make them reproducible. So we have a script that will, will help with that. So that's but kind of the high level state of where HEADS is now. Um, I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about where we're planning to go. Uh, and there's some really exciting news um, that just a couple days ago, the Purism laptop uh, company uh, announced that they're going to be uh, shipping their Librem 13 laptop with Core Boot and HEADS. And this is really exciting because it's a modern Skylake system, so we can finally uh, stop carrying around our our five-year-old ThinkPads and upgrade to a, a modern machine. The other really uh, interesting part is that they are going to ship them um, with the boot guard profile and the boot guard public key uh, unfused. This is a, uh, a one-time programmable fuse inside the management engine, or excuse me, inside the CPU that controls how the system boots uh, with, uh, with, the, with a boot guard. And right now, the only vendors who are using BootGuard are using it to lock out any sort of third-party firmware development. Um, so to be able to set your own key means that uh, you can really own this machine and uh, only you will be able to produce firmware that, uh, that boots on it. And this is a great uh, step for hardware security because it pretty much eliminates all but um, you know, the most sophisticated uh, evil made attacks. There are other devices in the systems that we need to be worried about. The embedded controller uh, is what handles keyboard input and other things. Um, and it's on most machines, it's closed source and is in a position to log keystrokes and interfere with a variety of operations. The Google Chromebooks have an open source uh, EC and uh, they do a remote attestation between the EC and the CPU in, in order to prove that the code uh, that should be running there is, is actually there. There's a few projects to try to port that to, uh, to the ThinkPads, and I'm hoping um, uh, the, the Librem laptops will also pick it up. The server landscape is uh, unfortunately not great right now for, for Core Boot. Um, the threat model in servers is really tough, uh, and there is so much programmable firmware on a server. Pretty much everything that I've uh, highlighted here has some sort of uh, firmware in it that you know, potentially we have to be concerned about. There are some groups like uh, Facebook and uh, the Open Compute Project that are trying to tackle uh, some of that. The, uh, the Yosemite servers from, uh, from op Open Compute um, have uh, in, in the, uh, the BMC here, uh, run uh, software from Facebook called OpenBNC that is open source uh, board management controller. And they've moved the hardware root of trust into there. And it's, that's a really uh, exciting place to put, um, to, to, uh, to move that, that root of trust because it, in this case it controls uh, four separate compute nodes. Um, I'm hoping that uh, uh, heads will be useful there. Uh, we're also collaborating with uh, the Mass Open Cloud project, which is looking at doing uh, bare metal uh, cloud uh, hosting, which is sort of a scary thing when you imagine, you know, what could a previous tenant have left as a surprise for a future tenant in inside the system firmware. So they have a, a TPM-based remote attestation framework called, called Keylime that they've been working on. And uh, we had a hackathon two weeks ago where they uh, were able to integrate Keylime into heads, have heads boot their systems, fetch kernels uh, over the network, and uh, hopefully ensure that there were no surprises left in the firmware from previous tenants. 
There are, of course, uh, plenty of open issues on the GitHub tree, and it is open source, and I would really uh, encourage everyone to, you know, if you have a compatible machine, please download it, try installing it, and uh, uh, help out with, with some of the issues. Um, and, you know, together, hopefully we can produce, you know, open, flexible, measured, auditable, you know, secure firmware for these machines. And I'm really hoping that we can, uh, you know, start to move the industry from away from, you know, this legacy UEFI firmware to modern software built with modern tools that, you know, is flexible and, and adaptable to, to what we need. So, love to answer any questions that uh, you all might have. And thanks again for staying uh, to, the, to this last session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Trevor. Any questions from the floor? Yes, on the left. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I want to ask a question about the TPM TLTP mechanism. So, uh, how does it reinforce the boot chain if you still don't have a hardware root of trust that gets executed by the hardware before the firmware is loaded? So, I mean, the Arogio firmware can supply the same hash to the, as an input to the TPM. So, so, the question is, how does the TPM uh, provide uh, the hardware root of trust? Um, so, with a system that has boot guard, the, uh, the legacy reset vector is no longer used. Instead, a signed uh, authenticated code module, uh, ACM, is, uh, is validated by the CPU microcode and the signature checked by the CPU microcode. And that is where the root of trust then ends up being established. The signature on that ACM, uh, excuse me, the key used to sign that ACM um, has its hash programmed into the CPU fuses, which are one-time programmable. So it's not possible for an adversary uh, to, uh, to um, subvert that unless they can swap out your CPU, which in the case of a, uh, a laptop would be very difficult. In the server, it's a little bit easier, but still challenging. Um, in the absence of boot guard, but if you're on a Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge, um, the hardware root of trust comes from the uh, using the, the non-volatile boot protect uh, bits in the, uh, in the spy flash which allows the, uh, uh, the flash to reserve, excuse me, to print writes to certain regions. Um, and by then disconnecting the write protect pin from the chipset, uh, devices like the ME are not, or software attacks running from the, um, uh, from the x86 are not able to override that write protection. Okay, so for legacy systems, if the evil mate is able to resolder the flash, then uh, so that, that would require an attacker to, res to uh, have hands-on to the flash to actually change it. Um, and if, depending on your threat model, that, that may be acceptable. You might say, you know, they're not going to get hands on it. But if you are concerned about an, an adversary with physical access um, to the inside of your machine, then uh, you know, boot guard is a, a much better, um, provides a, a higher level of, of trust. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you all.